I'm Joy Morris, inviting you to listen to True Stories of the Old West, hosted by C.R. King, a production of R.K. Enterprises. Welcome to my podcast. This is C.R. King. Podcast is about true stories of the Wild West. So, first episode is why hurt him? Of course. Was he a lawman or was he an outlaw? We will find out. Wyatt pinned his first badge when he was just just prior to 21 years old. He was a constable at Lamar, Missouri for approximately one and a half years. His wife, Morella, passed away. She was pregnant with her only child of typhoid. Wyatt did not handle that well. He left his job. He went out west, and he roamed around for a while. He's now 24. He's in Indian Territory, which is now called Oklahoma. He and two others were arrested for child for horse theft. There was a trial, sort of. The first man was let off due to his wife's um, testimony. Second man was found not guilty, and all charges were dropped for Wyatt. Well, he was a lucky man. Nothing happened to him. In this time frame, he also worked as a pimp. He was a guard. He did the same thing back in Lamar when he first put on his badge. It was standard operation to take care of the ladies of the night, to be bodyguards, and to be paid for that. And he did that without a badge on here in the West. Well, okay, we call it a pimp today. It was standard operation. By 1873, he became a buffalo hunter. He hunted for others and he hunted for himself. Hides were valuable. This is the first time this year at the Salt Fork of the Arkansas River where Wyatt met for the first time, Bat and Ed Masterson. Very, very famous man was the younger brother, Bat. Now, moving on, Wyatt wound up in Wichita, Kansas. He handled himself well. He was six foot tall, 180 pounds, solid as a just pure muscle. His brother, James, and his wife, Bessie, moved there. It was a booming cattle town, and they asked Wyatt to join him, which he did. Well, he handled himself so well that the existing town marshal, Bill Smith, followed his gut, and he asked Wyatt if he would like to be a deputy. Quickly, Wyatt agreed. Off and on, he was a deputy, he, and he wore the badge, but it wasn't considered full-time. The following year, there was an, ele- an election for town marshal, as there was for mayor and other positions. Mike Mager ran against Bill Smith, and he won. Mager kept Wyatt Earp on. He also hired, hired another man and expanded his, his police force of five. Well, the one thing about Wyatt was when he put on a badge, he was all lawman, strict to the letter of the law. Here's an example of something that he did that goes to his personality. The drovers did not like Wyatt. There was a new law put in place, no guns allowed. Check your guns in when you come into town. Check them out as you leave. Well, they ignored that. And there was a shooting or a a stabbing or just fist fights, you know, a lot of trouble. Drovers did not get along with Wyatt and they hated him. So they came back into town, but led by their their boss, a man by the name of Manning Clements. Manning was a big time rancher out of Texas. Fifty men rode onto that bridge that the entryway over the 
Arkansas River to Wichita. When Wyatt stood in, in the middle of that bridge, his deputies were behind him, and there was a sizable number of citizens, all armed. It was as if it was on cue. The citizens and the deputies branched out in a semicircle around that bridge, loaded, arms aimed, waiting for Wyatt's signal. Wyatt stood there calmly, looked at Manning, and said, Holster your gun and go back to your camp. Silence. Wyatt repeated himself, Holster your gun and go back to camp. Again, silence. Manning holstered his gun, turned, and he left. But his 15 men followed him. The deal was over with. Nobody was arrested. Nobody was shot. Nobody got hit. Wyatt Earp prevailed. He was straight. He never laughed. He never smiled. He had a reputation and it was getting bigger and bigger, and they obeyed him. That's why it hurt. So, I mentioned already that Marshall Mager went up against Bill, uh, Bill Smith and won, but in 74, I'm sorry, in April of 17, 1876, there was another election. Bill Smith wanted his job back, and for whatever reason, Wyatt Earp really liked and got along with Mike Mager, and he backed him. Bill Smith was not happy. He and Wyatt got into a fist fight. Wyatt was pulled off of him by Mager, the current town marshal, and he was fired on the spot. Well, Mager won re-election. He wanted to rehire Wyatt. The town council said no. Six to two. He's out. So, Wyatt left. He and his other younger brother, there is a Morgan, went to a little town called Deadwood. There in Deadwood, uh, he and his brother cut down the trees and cut up firewood and sold it. That's how they made a living. By the way, uh, he was the marshal, or existent marshal, I should say, in Wichita for a little over a year. All right, so moving on. There were problems in Deadwood. It was first place. It was not a part of the United States. It was Indian land. We had no right to be there, but they discovered gold. And there was also a little law. The the um, um, Wells Fargo stagecoach had contracts to move the gold out, and they were constantly being robbed. So they sought out Wyatt. They hired him. He was to be shotgun guard, if you will, for Wells Fargo on this one particular trip out. Wells Fargo published it in the papers. Well, as that stage left Deadwood, a whole body of outlaws were following it, and they trailed that for quite some ways. They stayed away from from the, the, the distance of the stagecoach so that Wyatt could not take aim and shoot anybody. He was so feared and so respected as a lawman and as a gunman. Stagecoach got through. The gold was delivered into the banks. <coughs> Wyatt was paid handsomely. The outlaws didn't get a dime. And things moved on. So, what happens next? Well, guess what? Wyatt went to Dodge City. It was now the new cattle town. As the trains moved towards the West, the towns became boom towns moved as well. Wichita didn't have much snap, 
So he was happy to leave that because he did go back to Wichita for a time and then over to Dodge. There, Wyatt, with his brothers, became Lobbin. When he arrived in Dodge, the mayor of the city hired him as the assistant marshal of the town. Bam Masterson was the county sheriff. Wyatt hired Bat's younger brother, James. And as it turns out in history, James was a better shot, a faster in the draw, and a better lawman than either he or his brother, Bat. Anyway, but they became friends and they worked together. Dodge City was more wild than Wichita, and Wichita was wild. Wichita's nickname was the Wicked City, or Wickedest City. Dodge City was named the Queen of the Cow Towns, because it was bigger, and they had a lot more problems. Every single day, there was something going on. In the evening, it was Dodge, I mean, it was Wyatt, and it was James. Who, who curtailed the town and dealt with it. Okay. One day, one day, there's a bunch of cowpokes. Again, they did not like, like Wyatt. They were polite to the women in the town, but they were not happy people. And they, too, refused to remove their guns. And they were buffaloed by Wyatt and others. Buffalo is when you hit somebody on the side of the head with his gun, knocks them out, or dizzy anyway, takes them to jail. That was one extent of capital punishment or any type of punishment. If he couldn't reason, he'd use his fist. If that didn't work, he'd use his gun. Either way, he got what he had to do. He did what he thought was best. He was not a believer in shooting people. So, he and his men did everything in their power to avoid problems before they got out of hand. Didn't always work. Right now, it's July 26th, 1878. 3 a.m. in the morning. There's a square dance going on at the Comic Q Theater. Drunk and fed up, the Texas drovers decided to leave town, but they also wanted to show that they were the boss. So they turned around and they fired into that theater. The people inside were not injured. They all hit the ground. But luckily, nobody was hurt. But they said it felt like there were 100 shots firing through that wooden building. Wyatt was there and they almost hit him. He's out front. They left in a hurry. One man laid back a little bit. He made extra shots. Wyatt ran out. He couldn't get him because the horse was too fast of him that he was on. His name was George Hoy, H O Y. He and James were in the middle of that street and they fired and they hit him. He fell off his horse. A month later, he passed away from his wounds. Wyatt took credit for that shooting, his first ever. But we're pretty sure, and we cannot prove it, that James Earp did the shooting. Why do we say that? Because he was a far better shot. So, if you want, you can mark that off as a Wyatt Earp shooting. That's fine. Who knows for sure? Wyatt had, a, had another older brother, Virgil. In fact, Virgil, Wyatt, and Morgan were known as the Fighting Earps. All three were lawmen, here or there. Virgil was a lawman in Prescott, Arizona. He got hired to be the deputy U.S. Marshal of the territory, assigned to Puma County. He wired his brothers and said, join me, join me at this new town called Tombstone. The brothers did. They were very close to each other. 
Uh, just so you know, in the early part of 79, Tombstone, they discovered silver. It became a boom town, as I said, by mid by de mid December of 79. There was a population around 900, and that population would grow exp 10, uh, well, I shouldn't say 10 times that, to about 5,000, if not more. Out of that 900, there were 150 by themselves from from San Diego, California. Most of the people in Tombstone came from San Diego. So when he got there, uh, Wyatt was appointed a deputy to Virgil for Pima County. But it was decided by the, the, by the politicians to separate and form a new county. And they called that county Cochise. And Tombstone was the county seat, for a while anyway. Wyatt resigned his position on January 29th. Okay. He did so because he wanted him, himself to be, to run for the election and become the county sheriff. Well, he lost. Bob Paul won. He appointed Johnny Beham to, the old, to Wyatt's old job. Beham was a former legislator and he had lots of political contacts. This was a political appointment. Wyatt's time on the job was six months. Altogether, Lamar, Wichita, uh, Dodge City, and here in Tombstone, his total time as a policeman was six years and ten months. We all know about the OK Corral. We all know what happened there. There was a shootout. Again, there was a law. No guns allowed. Check them in. Check them out when you leave. Mike Clayton was one of the heads of the cowboy function. I'm sorry. He was one of the heads of the cowboy faction. The cowboys would go over to Mexico, cross the border, rob the peasants, rob the ranchers, steal their horses, kill them if they needed to, bring them back, bring them back to cattle, the sheep, cut them up, sell them. Merchants loved the cowboys, but Mexico didn't, and what they did was terrible. Ike had problems with Wyatt Earp. He was drunk, he had his gun, his rifle, and he went around looking to kill an Earp. Yes. And everybody he saw, he, he questioned if they had seen Wyatt Earp or one of his brothers. Okay. So what happened there was the next day, the ultimate today of, of the OK Corral fight, Wyatt was sworn in by his brother, who was the town marshal. He and Morgan, Virgil, and Doc Holliday, close friend, walked down to an empty lot, and in that lot, there were six men. Two of them ran away. I caught him who was unarmed. He was told to get a gun or, or leave, and he ran. Billy Claiborne ran away as well. Okay, so the, these guys were all armed except for those two. And instead of putting down their guns, they started to draw. Virgil raised his cane and said, stop. I don't want that. It was too late. In less than 30 seconds, the men laid dead. Morgan was shot from what the bullet went into one shoulder and out the other shoulder, straight across his back. He was hurt pretty badly. White guy hit in the leg. Doc Holliday, well, he was lucky. He got hit, but it hit his gun belt, so he was bruised. Wyatt Earp was never touched. They went to trial. They were found not guilty. They did their job. It was called justifiable homicide. That trial 
lasted 30 days. It, it was a preliminary. It's the longest trial, preliminary trial in the history of Arizona to date. Well, things happened after that. Not sure how to say this, but Virgil was shot as he was crossing the street one night. He lost the use of his right arm. The bones were shattered. He was lucky to be alive. He almost didn't make it. But he was a cripple. Oh. Then he was under guard in a hotel while he healed. On December 28th, now remember, the, uh, the, the October 26th was the OK Corral. Virgil was killed or shot on the 28th of December. And in March, Morgan was assassinated and killed. Wyatt was almost hit, but he missed. The then U.S. Territorial Marshal made Wyatt a Deputy Marshal. He gave him $3,000 to pay for the posse and told him to go get him, to go get the leaders of the cowboy faction that killed his brother and crippled his other brother. Well, that's exactly what he did. Three men dead. And the, the posse of Earp and Doc Holliday went to Arizona and other places. Well, he resigned his position. He was the U.S. Marshal for a month. Now, if you take everything and add it up to this time, the total time as a lawman for Wyatt seven years. Now, we talked about that and I mentioned his, a little bit, he was a pimp. Yes, he was a pimp. And Dodge, I don't know, his brother was the town marshal. His brother got paid by the ladies of the night. Whether or not Wyatt got any money, I have no idea. I don't think anybody does. Uh, but he was a pimp in other towns. Anyway, <clears throat> moving on. He also, in Tombstone, would buy and sell claims. So that was another way of making money. Wyatt was into money. He wanted to be rich. He wanted to be famous. He wanted all of that. He wanted to, wanted to be respected. He was respected. But he was never really accepted. Except by the sporting crowd. Sporting as in the gamblers, the horse racers, the horse track racers, the ladies of the night. So, so he was arrested as a pimp a couple of times. And then again, and in Wichita and Dodge City, he was paid by these people, by these ladies. Passed away. He, he got arrested for horse theft. Got away with it. But I, when he was was a lawman in that short time with Pima. He did foil petty crime, chase horse thieves, hunted down j uh, lot jumpers, hunted down killers. He did it all. But he did now have a record of having killed four men. So, what we do now, what he did now, I should say, is he wound up in San Diego. San Diego, California. It's a good place to be. He opened up three different gambling saloons or gambling dens. They always had a little saloon in there, of course. Three. They were illegal. It was against the law to have gambling inside the city limits. But he did it anyway. Because his old buddy, Mr. Hutsacker, who was his attorney in Tombstone, was the mayor of the city. Things come to an end. Hunsacker was kind of pushed out of his job. He resigned and he went to Los Angeles. 
Wyatt, after four years, left as well. His wife was a, a gambler, and she was terrible, and she kept losing his money. She would go broke because of her gambling habits. So, he was lucky he lucked out. Wyatt was summoned and hired by the Hearst family. Now, why the Hearst? Because Randolph Hearst was in Tombstone for a short time, and he had hired Wyatt as his bodyguard as he hunted for more silver. He didn't do well, so he left. But up in, in San Francisco, he was the owner of the Examiner, a yellow sheet journalistic type newspaper, but the largest. And his editor, Andy Lawrence, they called him Long Green, because the stuff he did under the table was being threatened constantly. His job was to protect Andy Lawrence, and he did. And he was flush again. And things happened, you know, like I said, he's always looking for a shortcut to earn money. His mainstay was gambling. And before I move on to what happened next here, going back to Tombstone, Wyatt Earp was the head of a gambling syndicate. Saloons, the gambling tables, they all had to pay him a piece of the money for protection. Didn't know that, did you? Well, it's true. December 2nd, 1896. Well, the seven Starkey fight for the heavyweight champion of the world was going to be held in San Francisco. It was held in San Francisco. And Mr. Lawrence and his crew got Wyatt Earp to be the referee. Well, it was a hell of a match. Fitzsimmons had Sharky beat. There's no doubt about it. There's way too many people watching that fight to argue with. But suddenly, Wyatt declared Starkey the winner and gave him the prize money of $10,000. Why? Because he claimed that Fitzsimmons hit Sharky below the waist. But in reality, Fitzsimmons knocked him out. Knockout punch. That's not in the waist, that's in the head. Wyatt was arrested. The case was dismissed. He was being tried in, in the wrong court, and Wyatt left. He also left with $2,500 for being the referee of that fight kind of underhanded money being handed out to him. Okay, so in uh, 1906, in 1906, I'm sorry, 1909, Arthur Moore King, was a policeman, was brought, was fired because all of the city hall people were fired. The mayor was forced to quit. Los Angeles was a dirty town. The police department was a dirty town. And, and, uh, and Arthur was a bad man for the town marshal. He did his job well as a, as, a, as a policeman, but he was asked to collect money, and he did every month, every week, whatever it was, the title of the element. And he lost his job. Three months later, they brought him back. Captain Flanders of the Los Angeles Police Department was told to clean up the police department. He brought him back, he talked to him, he offered him a job under the table, not wearing a badge, but a bounty hunter, a private policeman in those days. His job was to be the deputy of this other man who had more experience at it, to go out and to bring back those men and women who had escaped or paid off their cards and left in a hurry to other parts of the country. That other man was Wyatt Earp. Wyatt Earp was 60. Arthur Moore King was 25. And together they were partners. Wyatt Earp, last deputy in a sense, was Arthur Moore King. Thus my book, The Last Deputy, the story of these two men 
a good read. So they did this for three years. And uh, in between that, they were hired again outside of the law by the Hearst family to go to Mexico. Mexico was on the verge of civil war. They had a million acre ranch there. And Wyatt was to go in there and shore up and protect that ranch. So it was his deputy as well. And they went. They knew Pancho Villa would come to them sooner or later. So they had a, did a, a series of things. They buried their guns. They had uh, contingencies where to put the women. And one day, not long after they arrived, Pancho Villa with an army of 50,000 showed up. It was contentious, but Pancho knew of Wyatt Earp's reputation. Because Wyatt Earp killed the men who was killing the people of Mexico when they were in Tombstone. And because of that, it stopped a, a war from happening. The Mexican army was spread out. They were going to come over the border and take over Tombstone and the, ter and the territory. We were more mounting a, a getting ready to call, to, to declare, I should say, martial law. But when the leaders were killed off, they all dispersed. There was no war. To this day, I'm pretty sure the reason he was never arrested for murder was because he stopped a war from happening. So he made a deal with Pancho Villa. They could have all the cattle they want. They could eat the cows. I mean, it was like 50, 60,000 head of cattle, thousands of heads of sheep, pigs, you name it. Vegetables growing everywhere. But they could camp out there, but leave the women alone. Do not harm the men. The deal was struck. There's another story about how they got away. It's a very interesting, interesting story. Check out the book, The Last Deputy by C.R. King. Moving on, going back to where I was at. As a lawman, or while they were bounty hunters, the Hearst family came to them and they went to, to, to Mexico. And they got away. But then they got hired again by another man. He was the commissioner of the LAPD. He was to join forces and put together a man, 15-man security force. Actually, his partner, Arthur, did that. Arthur knew everybody. And they were to go to Death Valley, to Truona, the Borax Works. So there, Henry Lee, who was the next lawyer for the Truona company, wanted to overthrow or claim jump the mining the mine uh, claims and claim reclaim them for himself. Well that didn't go over very well. And there was a shootout. Well kind of. The shootout actually was one man wider shooting a rifle in between the legs of the federal agent by the name of Stafford. He was because the the um, uh, Toronto company was in receivership at that time. Earp and and uh, Kane were arrested, let go when they got back to to uh, San Bernardino by the U.S. Marshals. But there was there would be a trial. Well, this hit the papers big time. Why had Earp arrested? Arthur Moore arrested. The whole thing in Trona went down in the papers. Um, then a few weeks later, in Los Angeles, there was a man who had a lot of money apparently, Peterson, and he wanted to gamble. So Wyatt and some others set up a gambling game of Fargo in a hotel. Totally illegal. Somehow, oh by the way, it was 
fixed. But somehow, Los Angeles police got a hold of it, crashed in through the door, arrested Wyatt. And they charged him. But the charges were reduced to vacancy, vagrancy, because they arrested him before any money changed hands. There was, there was really nothing. Anyway, so what happened here was, well, they had enough. Wyatt and Arthur Moore were fired. That was 2012, or no, excuse me. <laughs> that was 1912. And they split up. They were no longer friends. They did not like each other. Wyatt was getting in crazy. He was drinking. Arthur was married. He was trying to move on with his life. So, as I mentioned, Wyatt was a frontier lawman for a few years. Seven. Seven years. If you count the three years he was a bounty hunter, you could say ten. But he did not wear a badge. He was a pimp in most of the towns he worked in. He did kill 30 men. You can call it justifiable. You tell me. Uh, that's basically it. So, my question to you, knowing what I just told you, what was he? A lawman? Or an outlaw? Before I let you go, he never received acceptance into the upper echelons. He, he made fortunes and he lost fortunes. He died at the age of 78 in Los Angeles. He was pitiless. His wife had gambled all their money away. Good luck everybody and oh, stay tuned for the next episode. Stay tuned for next week's tale.